I think we should uh, get started with the uh, last panel for this afternoon. Uh, just to provide you with an example of the truth of Margot Priest's statement this morning, that where you stand depends on where you sit, I want to announce now that I'm going to adhere very strictly to time limits. It's too bad you don't do that in court. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have a, a one, once again, a quite distinguished panel here. Uh, the the no person presenting the uh, paper, the major speaker, who tells me that he hates introductions, which leads me, of course, to want to make a long one, uh, is John Laskin. Um, John, um, let me just put it this way. John is the head of the litigation department at Davies Warden Beck. He's been a counsel to the Ontario Human Rights Commission and to several provincial public in inquiries. Uh, including the Royal Commission on Health and Safety Effects of Asbestos and the Ontario inqu Inquiry into Motor Vehicle Accident Compensation. Uh, I know uh, that he's represented the Ontario Securities Commission on a number of, of matters, um, all of which have been resolved correctly, I might say. Um, <laughs> and uh, he's also been a member of the uh, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal since 1985 and is a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers and a director of the Advocates Society. In order to expedite the process, I'll follow Hudson's example and introduce you to his commentators now. Um, running alphabetically, the first commentator is, on John's right, is Raj Anand. Raj is a, a partner with the Toronto office of Scott and Aylin, and his areas of specialization include civil litigation, human rights, constitutional and administrative law, and labor relations. Uh, he's a former Chief Commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, uh, has acted as counsel to the Canadian and Ontario Human Rights Commission, uh, as well as uh, counsel to complainants before various levels of hearings before human rights commissions. Uh, he currently acts as a Board of Inquiry under the Ontario Human Rights Code and under the Citizen Complaints Provisions of the Police Services Act, and as counsel to a number of administrative tribunals. And there are too many of them there to list. Um, the second commentator is Linda First. Linda is the person second on my left, in case you wouldn't have guessed. Um, I know that's an improper comment these days, too. Um, <laughs> thank you, Linda. Linda is a senior investigation counsel with the Ontario Securities Commission. Uh, she's been an investigation counsel at the OSC in the Enforcement and Market Regulation Branch since 1988. Prior to joining the commission, she worked as a criminal defense lawyer. Um, I guess that was a crisis of conscience that brought her to the commission. And she served as a law clerk to the chief, no one liked that, uh-oh. Uh, she served as a law clerk to the chief justice of the High Court of Ontario, and then as special assistant to the president of the Law Reform Commission of Canada after her call to the bar in 1983. Uh, the third commentator on this panel is uh, Howard Weston, who's on my immediate left. Uh, Howard is the Director of Investigation and Research um, of the, and, and I guess the ADM or, uh, of the Bureau of Competition Policy uh, and has been for the last three years. Um, from October 86, he was a Senior Deputy Director in the uh, Competition Bureau where he was accountable for the overall direction and management of the merger branch. Prior to that, he was in the private practice of law in Calgary and Montreal. Uh, where he'd worked in the uh, area of general administrative law with an emphasis on, not surprisingly, economic regulation. Um, and he represented clients before a number of regulatory agencies and tribunals. Uh, before entering private practice, he also served as general counsel to the Canadian Transport Commission and assistant general counsel to the National Energy Board. And prior to that, he was with the Consumers Association of Canada. I say that just to show you that the Consumers Association of Canada has been here twice today. Um, with that, I'll get on with the serious business here and simply uh, call on John. Thanks, Phil. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a little bit intimidating to be up here amongst uh, these panelists and amongst so many distinguished people in the audience because I think I consider myself to be a generalist in the field of administrative law. Uh, not so much a specialist, so the views you're going to get this afternoon are uh, the views of a generalist. Um, I've chosen to talk about uh, three issues, um, none of them easily uh, discernible in my paper, so put my paper away. 
Um, and the issues are the following. Um, number one, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of recent charter cases on the investigative powers of administrative agencies, uh, particularly in light of the two fairly recent judgments of the Supreme Court of Canada in Thompson Newspapers and McKinley Transport. Uh, two cases, I might say, which have caused some of us to yearn for the old days of the Privy Council uh, when we had a court that spoke with uh, one voice and one judgment. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I might call the new ASCOF defense in administrative proceedings. And uh, lastly, um, what I might call the newfound contempt powers of administrative agencies. So let me start with uh, investigative powers and the charter. Uh, first of all, the powers. Uh, the language varies from statute to statute, and the requirements might vary from statute to statute, but essentially we are talking about three powers. Uh, number one, the power to inspect and uh, conduct spot audits, generally of businesses, almost always without a warrant, and therefore we have the so-called warrantless searches. Secondly, uh, the companion power to either seize or compel production of documents and make copies of them. And thirdly, uh, the power to examine individuals under oath and gather evidence, or what amounts uh, virtually to the same thing if you're talking about self-governing professions like our own profession, uh, the power to compel uh, testimony from uh, practitioners like us uh, under the threat of pro professional discipline proceedings if we don't cooperate. Uh, most agencies, I think, have the first two powers. Some, but not all, have the third. And the issue has become, uh, do any or all of those investigative powers infringe either Section 7 or Section 8 of the Charter? And so just to remind all of us, Section 7, uh, the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived of this guarantee, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Uh, a guarantee, it seems to me, that we have yet to see the full scope and content of. Uh, I think of all the charter rights and freedoms that we have, Section 7 is probably the most elastic one, and the one in which uh, our Supreme Court has yet to fully define its contours. Uh, and Section 8, uh, the right to be secure against unreasonable and emphasize unreasonable searches and seizures. So the background of this issue is really the following. Um, when we talk about Section 8, the background, of course, is Hunter and Southam, uh, decided by our Supreme Court in 1984. And without getting into a very technical, detailed discussion of Hunter and Southam, basically Hunter and Southam, to me, did three things. Uh, number one, it defined and identified the competing interests that were relevant to a Section 8 analysis. And they were balancing interests, so that you had on the one hand the individual's reasonable expectation of privacy, and on the other, the government's and the public's interest in the enforcement of the law. Secondly, of course, it set out the criteria, what we all thought were the criteria, for a valid search and seizure under Section 8. And just briefly, they were prior authorization were feasible, i.e. a warrant, given by an independent arbiter, i.e. someone detached from the agency itself that was seeking the authorization, and thirdly, given on the basis of reasonable and probable grounds that inappropriate, improper, offensive conduct uh, had been committed. Then the third thing that Hunter and Southam did, and this became the touchstone and to me the most important observation of all, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada said those are the criteria, but let's all remember that they're flexible criteria. And the standards are flexible and they may not apply in all cases. And that last comment, of course, became the trigger for analyzing all of the subsequent cases. Because the reality is when you look at investigative powers across the field of regulatory agencies in this country, you will virtually not find a regulatory agency whose investigative powers are circumscribed by the strict Hunter and Southam standards. And therefore the question becomes, to what extent is the court prepared to relax those standards and uphold uh, regulatory legislation? That's the Section 8 background. 
Uh, the Section 7 background is this. Um, Madam Justice Wilson, who I think probably amongst all of the judiciary has been one who has pushed the limits of Section 7 about as farther perhaps than anyone else, said in a case called Wigglesworth about five years ago, which was a police discipline case, which probably a lot of you remember, she said, well, look, you can't use the criminal law guarantees in sections 11, 12, and 13 uh, for individual protections in administrative proceedings. But what you might be able to do is use section 7 to accomplish the same result. And therefore, she basically said, don't look to section 11, don't look to section 12, but you might be able to look to section 7, the flexible criteria of section 7 to mount a case which is akin to some kind of charter case under Section 11. That's the background. Now we come to the issues. Our provincial appellate courts across the country, and our Ontario Court of Appeal was no different, have had in general no difficulty whatsoever in upholding regulatory legislation in the face of charter challenges under Section 7 and Section 8. Um, there are four judgments of our Court of Appeal, which I think I've referred to in, uh, in my paper. There are innumerable judgments across the rest of the country. There's a judgment of the Federal Court of Appeal. They have had no difficulty. Then we got Thompson Newspapers and McKinley Transport handed down back to back in March of 1990. Five judges sat on each court, and there were a total of no less than nine judgments in those two cases. So that you can see for all of us who try to struggle with this, um, how difficult it is to try to distill any kind of ratio out of what the court said. Uh, Linda first, and I don't know whether you've seen it, but Linda has done an absolutely admirable paper in my view on trying to figure out the implications of Thompson newspapers on Section 7 issues, and I'm not going to tread on her ground. I encourage you to read the paper. Um, what I'm going to offer to you is my own views, and they are tentative views, as to what I think in general uh, the results of those two cases might be for investigatory powers of administrative tribunals who, and agencies who are in the business of regulating and who are governed by comprehensive regulatory legislation. So um, I've sort of distilled it down to about six propositions. There's no magic in that, and let me just give them to you. Um, number one. Um, the courts, I think, have consistently drawn a distinction between an investigation in furtherance of suspected criminal activity and the exercise of investigatory powers as part of the administration of a regulatory scheme. And I think when all is said and done, the Hunter and Southam standards have largely been confined to the former kind of statutory scheme. Um, it's a distinction that I think runs through all of the subsequent cases, and it is a distinction that is found in the two Supreme Court of Canada judgments. And depending upon how you characterize the legislation, it almost determines the results. I think it is worth making the observation that Hunter and Southam and Thompson newspapers were both cases decided under the Combines Investigation Act. And historically, that statute rightly or wrongly, has been thought of much more in a criminal context than it has been in a regulatory context. And if you look at the old Division of Powers case law, you know that the Combines Investigation Act was never really justified until recently as an exercise in the trade and commerce power. It was always justified as an exercise of the criminal law power. And I think when you are looking at those cases, particularly Hunter and Southam and, and Thompson newspapers, I think you have to bear that in mind because I suspect that that has colored the thinking of the judges who have come to adjudicate on that case. And their approach, I think, may not be the same when you come to look at a statute like the Securities Act or the Occupational Health and Safety Act or whatever. Now, the corollary point is that the court has said that your reasonable privacy expectation in the administrative context will be lower than it will be in the criminal law context. Why that should always be so 
is not 100% clear to me. Um, there may be just as much intrusiveness in a search in the administrative field as there might be in the criminal law field. It seems to me that you've got to look at what you're searching for, uh, where you're searching for it, and when you're conducting the search. A uh, search of ordinary business records on business premises at 11 o'clock in the morning is one thing. Uh, a search for private papers at uh, 9 o'clock at night uh, in a dwelling place uh, may be quite another. But in any event, there is a principle running through these cases that there is a lower expected privacy interest in these kinds of administrative powers. The second proposition I would advance to you, and I think it flows from the first, is that warrantless inspections and spot audit provisions are not going to infringe Section 8. I think there is even some doubt as to whether those kinds of inspections or spot audits even constitute a search. If they do constitute a search, I think the court is going to hold, and certainly our appellate courts have held, that the search is reasonable. Third, the compelled production of documents or the seizure of documents in the context of ensuring compliance with a regulatory scheme does not, in my view, and will not be held, in my view, either to infringe the Charter. So Securities Commission legislation, um, self-governing profession legislation, um, employment standards legislation, all of that legislation, I think the provisions for compelled production or seizure of documents, my own view is, um, they are constitutional. Um, then I move to proposition number four, which is much, we get into a much more troublesome area, and that is the relationship between section seven and the statutory obligation to submit to some kind of an oral examination in aid of execution, in aid of an investigation. Section seven, our Supreme Court has said, does provide some kind of protection against self-incrimination where Section 11, subsection C of the Charter does not apply. But I would suggest that as long as the compelled examination is in furtherance only of possible administrative proceedings under the particular statute, as opposed to criminal type proceedings, then in my view, a court is going to hold no infringement of Section 7. And I say that whether or not the person to be examined is the possible subject of those administrative proceedings or simply a witness uh, in furtherance of some evidence against somebody else. Fifth, and this is the real problematic issue to me, and that is whether a, when a forced examination of a witness can lead to criminal or quasi-criminal charges and where the person being examined may be the subject of those charges. And then the question is, do you have a Section 7 akin to uh, infringement of your right of self-incrimination problem? Um, that is a difficult thing to be a prognosticator on because of the way the court came down in Thompson newspapers. Uh, my own hunch is that the given the current court uh, that the majority will probably still show considerable deference to the legislative scheme where the legislation is primarily regulatory in nature even though there remains the possibility of potential criminal charges down the line. Um, but that is anybody's guess. Um, the last proposition I suggest to you is that it should be entirely inappropriate and should be an infringement of Section 7 for an agency who conducts one of these forced examinations or compelled examinations to turn around and take the evidence and deliver it over to the police or other law enforcement agency, uh, a practice that is not unknown to some of our administrative agencies. Uh, my own view is that that is arguably a contravention of Section 7. So uh, with that, let me uh, move on to what I have uh, colloquially called the Askoff defense. Um, and I am here talking about cases in which 
the enabling legislation of administrative agencies does not contain its own limitation period. There are some that do, but there are many that do not. And there is recent case law, none at the Supreme Court of Canada level, and none of which I am aware at any high level in this court, which suggests that agencies may be accountable for what amounts to failure to conduct a hearing within a reasonable period of time, akin to failure to hold a trial within a reasonable period of time. You can't use Section 11B of the Charter, but once again, mobilizing Section 7 in support of the argument, you may be able to use Section 7 to mount what is essentially the same kind of defense. And there are two elements of the Section 7 attack, one of which I think is suspect and at least open to question. Um, the element that I think is open to question is that some courts have held that it is a deprivation of one's ability, it is a deprivation of one's security of the person or one's liberty to be put in jeopardy of being able to continue to practice law or to have one's uh, trading exemptions removed or um, to have a cease and desist order made against one or to have a finding of discrimination or so on, to look at a sort of general array of remedial powers that various agencies can offer. Um, the other element in the attack is that if there is inordinate delay in having a hearing come forward, that may be a denial of fundamental justice. I think that proposition is easier to accept than the first one. Because I think provincial appellate courts have been quite divided on how far you can take Section 7 in cases like this, given the sort of generally accepted proposition that Section 7, like any other section of the Charter, doesn't protect economic rights per se. Um, I, mean, I say that our Ontario courts, uh, rightly or wrongly, I'm not passing judgment here, but our Ontario courts have not been very receptive in other contexts to an argument that the loss of your ability to practice your profession or the loss of your livelihood or the loss of all kinds of things like that that sort of have economic consequences engage Section 7 interests. Um, other provincial courts across the country have taken a different view. Um, perhaps the one that has gone farthest the other way is the British Columbia Court of Appeal, and a lot of you in the audience will be familiar with Wilson and uh, the Medical Services Commission of British Columbia. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada has yet to really pronounce on whether you can bring Section 7 in in these kinds of cases. Um, they decided they didn't have to decide the issue in a recent case called Perlman and the Law Society of Manitoba. Um, they refused leave to appeal in Wilson, and so that issue to me is very much up uh, for grabs, but there's no doubt that there are a couple of courts across the country um, in other provinces which have fastened on to this ask-off defense um, in uh, administrative proceedings. Um, if the argument is going to be sustained at all, um, it is at least going to require the following. Uh, number one, uh, a lengthy period of delay, and the courts haven't been very uh, sophisticated in distinguishing the sort of between pre-notice of hearing delay and post-notice of hearing delay. Anything pre-hearing delay seems to count uh, in the administrative law context. Secondly, of course, the delay can't be anything attributable to your client if you're on the defense side and trying to make this argument. And, and thirdly, um, the courts are not, as I read the cases, going to infer prejudice simply from the delay. You're going to have to have actual, affirmative, positive evidence of prejudice flowing from the delay, which only stands to reason um, because we're dealing with... Uh, we're dealing with avoiding hearings in the context of statutes and acting in the public interest and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that is where that uh, defense now stands. There's a recent judgment out of Newfoundland and there's another judgment out west which have given effect to those defenses. Um, it, it has been uh, tried uh, uh, by some of us in Ontario, not at the court level, but in the context of uh, administrative agencies themselves certainly in my case, uh, singularly unsuccessfully before the Law Society. So we shall see. <laughs>
Uh, last thing I just wanted to talk briefly about um, is the contempt powers or the new contempt powers that seem to be emerging um, in administrative agencies. One of the things that I think has always troubled regulators uh, is that we say glibly that they are the masters of their own proceedings and yet in one very important area which is enforcing their own area, air orders we have in a sense made them subservient to the courts or perhaps to be more charitable about it we have made them partners with the courts in enforcing their own orders now part of all of this as you probably know is a section 96 issue uh, that is Section 96 of the 1867 Constitution Act, which, as you all know, in form is a power to approve the appoint or a power to appoint uh, superior court judgments, but in substance has been turned into, because of our constitutional jurisprudence over the years, as a limitation on the ability of administrative tribunals to exercise certain, quote, judicial type powers. And uh, all of you will remember uh, Justice Dixon's judgment in the Residential Tenancies Act reference, which sort of set out a threefold test to get into this issue, and it's been elaborated on in subsequent cases. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here talking about the Section 96 issue. But the issue of enforcement of orders has recently crystallized over the exercise of the contempt power. Uh, the general understanding had been, I think, of a lot of regulators that only courts can commit for contempt and the tribunals don't have that power and whether that's a Section 96 matter or a policy matter or a signal of the importance of uh, the contempt power, that had been sort of a general understanding of a lot of agencies. And secondly, and perhaps flowing from it, when the court is hearing a motion for contempt, based on a refusal, for example, to comply with an administrative agency's order, it had always been understood that the court could, in effect, go behind the order and look at the order on its merits and decide whether or not to give effect to it. Um, if that was the law, um, then I say that probably both of those decisions are no longer the law as a result of two very recent judgments of the Supreme Court of Canada uh, one is the Chrysler case, which Howard will know far better than I do, um, a signal and landmark case involving the competition tribunal, and secondly, uh, the Alberta nurses case um, involving uh, a provision of the Alberta Labor Relations Board. And it seems to me that in both cases, uh, what the Supreme Court is clearly signaling is its recognition um, of the importance of administrative tribunals in the adjudication of disputes in our society, if there was any doubt about it. And the court is really saying that if the legislature clearly gives these kinds of remedial powers to administrative agencies, we as a court are not going to be quick to strike them down on uh, constitutional grounds. Um, what specifically I think the Supreme Court of Canada made clear is number one, um, that all administrative tribunals have the power to commit for contempt in facie, that is, in the face of the tribunal, um, and that they can exercise that power to enforce obedience to their own processes without having to interrupt a hearing and run the risk of going to the court. And I must confess, I didn't really completely understand that that was the significance of the Chrysler case uh, when I read it, because that wasn't really what was before the court in Chrysler. But then I read uh, Mr. Reed's uh, administrative law paper, and um, someone who I personally happen to consider was one of the finest administrative law judges we've ever had in this province, and he made that point in spades. And indeed, when you go back and read Justice Gontier's decision in the Chrysler case, that's the first and foremost proposition that comes out of it, let alone what they all ultimately decided about uh, the exercise of contempt power out of the face of the court. And I think that's a very important proposition. Um, it's a proposition that's sort of at odds in a way with uh, Section 13 of the Statutory Powers Procedure Act, which sort of contemplates that you have to rush off to the court to uh, enforce contempt proceedings, for example, against a defaulting witness. Anyway, that's point number one. Point number two, um, 
seems to me, is that Parliament, if Parliament is clear enough, or if a legislature is clear enough, as the majority of the court found it had been in the case of the Competition Tribunal, then a tribunal will have a contempt power in relation to at least one kind of contempt out of the face of the court, and that is contempt for breach of an agency's own order. Now, you can't take the Chrysler case to stand for the proposition that every agency across this country has that power, because quite clearly that's not what the court said. It said this tribunal, the Competition Tribunal, has that power because of the particular language of the Competition Tribunal Act. But it nonetheless signals to me in a very important way that when all is said and done, these are policy questions for Parliament or the legislature. They're much more policy questions than they are any longer sort of constitutional questions. And on balance, I would expect that these are welcome developments perhaps they can be seen in a wider context as part of the court's overall deference to the decision-making of administrative tribunals. So um, that's what I wanted to say briefly about those three issues. Thank you for your attention, and I turn it over to my panelists. <laughs> uh, thank you, John Raj. Thank you, Phil. I want to respond to um, John's uh, paper and uh, his presentation uh, to the extent that it deals with the same issues um, <laughs> by um, <laughs> providing uh, s something of a brief case study, if you like, um, to focus on some of the same issues that John dealt with by drawing some comparisons and contrasts specifically from the human rights enforcement context and particularly the provincial one, that is the Ontario one. Um, and I'd like to deal um, with three issues. One, the issue of delay uh, and the um, consequences, the so-called Askov issue. Um, secondly, voluntary compliance and undertakings, which is dealt with in, in John's paper, but he hasn't really touched on it uh, just now. Um, and thirdly, and related to that, the, the flip side, if you like, of voluntary compliance, and that is what John has dealt with in some detail, and that is search and seizure, um, entering premises, compelling testimony, those, uh, those matters. Uh, let me just say a word about, the, just to put this in the specific case study context of the general legislative scheme, which is in effect in most provinces, including Ontario, for human rights enforcement, and that is essentially that a complaint is filed by an individual or an organization or is initiated by the Commission, the Ontario Human Rights Commission in this case. Um, that complaint is investigated by a human rights officer um, and um, after investigation the um, human rights officer is required by statute to attempt to reach a settlement uh, that is an informal resolution of the matter. If it, the matter can't be resolved um, in that way, the officer writes a report which wends its way to the commission, that is the commissioners, those who are the order and council appointees whom we heard about this morning, and um, uh, they are required to make a decision uh, as to whether the matter should be dismissed um, or whether it should go on to an independent human rights board of inquiry, which is a quasi-judicial proceeding um, in which uh, generally one person uh, appointed from a panel holds a hearing afresh, so it's a trial de novo if you like, in, and at that point the commission is in essence the prosecutor. It is the body having carriage of the case and it attempts to prove that the complaint is justified as the commission uh, came, uh, concluded that it was in sending it on to a board of inquiry. So in that general legislative context, how did these, these issues arise? Well firstly, the issue of delay, um, I probably don't have to say very much about that. Delays in, delays in the human rights context are a matter of uh, public record, um, <laughs> constant complaint, um, often justified, and, um, and have been the matter of various administrative initiatives by commissions and by governments, including um, uh, the present government and the present commission right now. Um, there are, I believe, three cases which have, um, uh, which have um, essentially stayed complaints at the Board of Inquiry level because of delay. Um, 
uh, two in Saskatchewan, which went to the Court of Appeal, which are referred to in my paper, Cadellus and Douglas, and then a Manitoba case, Nisbet, which um, is referred to and which John refers to in his paper as well, in, um, w which followed those cases, and which, um, uh, which um, engaged Section 7 in the course of their analysis, Section 7 of the Charter. Uh, in Ontario, um, from time to time at the Board of Inquiry level, it uh, looks as if um, an abuse of process or delay uh, preliminary motion is the obligatory first step of every Board of Inquiry hearing. Um, it certainly happens quite frequently. Um, there have been many decisions. Um, none has been successful in the province of Ontario thus far. Um, and uh, as I say, typically it's on the, on the footing of abuse of process in the administrative law context, as well as an argument under Section 7 of the Charter that um, the, the uh, jeopardy and indignity and um, uncertainty over the lengthy time period of a human rights investigation, uh, as I say, engages um, security of the person or liberty concerns under Section 7, and um, that therefore the hearing should be stayed. Um, the uh, courts have said very clearly that these matters are to be raised at the Board of Inquiry level, at least initially, rather than being taken to court. And um, as I say, they uh, very frequently are. Secondly, on the issue of voluntary compliance and um, undertakings, um, as I'll be going into in a bit more detail in a moment, under the search and seizure powers, the, the search powers under the, in the Human Rights Code, um, the statutory powers to enter upon premises and to, to obtain a search warrant and that, those kinds of things um, have not been uh, used in Ontario um, at all um, over the last uh, 10 years, to my knowledge, since the Ontario Human Rights Code in its present form was passed um, in 1982. And perhaps I can just, I can just jump ahead to, to ex explain that for a moment. The, um, under the pre-1982 code, uh, what you had was essentially the um, warrantless search uh, powers that John spoke of that are frequently found in employment standards legislation, health and safety legislation, that kind of thing. Uh, you found that in the human rights context. In 1981, during the legislative debates, there was a, a concerted campaign by a, a cabal of uh, legislatures, uh, legislators um, assisted by uh, certain editorialists about the uh, intrusive actions of the thought police. And um, it resulted in um, the introduction in what was otherwise a, a broadening and or liberalizing of the uh, Human Rights Commission's powers. Uh, it resulted in, in a narrowing of those powers and, and an, uh, an insertion of, I think, what um, the Supreme Court in the later Section 8 cases um, required of investigations in a criminal context. That is, uh, the obtaining of a warrant before an impartial judicial officer. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to those sections in detail in a moment. Uh, the sections refer to um, an officer or a, a, of the commission applying to a justice of the peace um, for a warrant in the prescribed form. And um, the form wasn't prescribed for <laughs> eight years. That's part for the book. So uh, the last four years of the conservative government, the in, virtually the entire five years of the liberal government, uh, until June 2nd, 1990, there was no form on which to obtain a, a warrant. And uh, this was a well-kept secret, I can tell you at the Human Rights Commission because um, if it were generally known, the degree of voluntary compliance and cooperation might have been somewhat less on the part of respondents. Um, so that officers would essentially go to um, the premises of the people being investigator, the company, whatever the enterprise was, and, uh, and say that he or she was an investigator, that certain questions were, were the, the, the investigator wanted certain questions to be answered, wanted to see certain documents, wanted to interview certain witnesses, that kind of thing. And um, generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that there was cooperation, uh, perhaps because people didn't know that the form had never been prescribed. Um, 
it's, I say it's open to question in the paper, and, and that's perhaps a euphemism, um, that um, this uh, cooperation and the, compl uh, and the information that was provided was complete. Um, in, in general, I think it's fair to say that, that quite often at boards of inquiry, one hears evidence come out that was uh, not made the subject of investigation or was not obtained during investigation. Um, but nevertheless, there is this element, which is, I think, an interesting administrative uh, issue of um, voluntary compliance and undertakings resulting in a uh, reasonably effective uh, regulatory scheme, um, because w where the uh, officer doesn't obtain um, cooperation, his or her only um, recourse under the legislation is to ask the commission to seek the search warrant, which couldn't be obtained uh, until very recently, or to send the case to a board of inquiry. There's a very, it's a very odd provision in that sense, in that if an investigation can't be conducted, your recourse is to send it to a hearing, um, which is normally the outgrowth of an investigation that determines there's enough evidence for a hearing. But that's the statutory scheme under which it operates. Um, in, um, in terms of um, John's um, uh, discussion of search and seizure generally, I want, I want to deal with that in, in a little bit more detail in the human rights context. Um, as I've said, most human rights investigations have proceeded on the basis of voluntary disclosure. Um, the investigative sections which provide for search warrant powers uh, and applications to a justice of the peace are, I, I think it's fair to say, from my reading of the uh, Supreme Court's jurisprudence on Section 8, more or less in compliance, although they clearly preceded all of that jurisprudence, including the charter itself. Um, and um, uh, just to, to um, supplement what I said a moment ago about voluntary disclosure, there is a section of the Act which, um, in addition to the ones I've referred to, which um, prohibits any person from hindering, obstructing, or interfering with a person in the execution of a warrant, well, we didn't have to worry about that because there was no warrant, or otherwise impeding an investigation under this Act. Uh, and so I suppose, again, in terms of the, the, the threat of sanctions, although it's, it's, it's never been um, invoked and probably could never be invoked, it could have been said that not to answer questions and to provide documents and to ad allow admission was to impede an investigation. Um, I say that because the, the, the Human Rights Code, as I say, is, 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 is written in the context of a highly public debate and involves a good deal of compromise. And, and so you find in the code that the officer has the right to question, but there's nothing about compelling answers. Um, and so uh, you don't get the third issue that John talked about in terms of compelling people to testify against themselves or indeed to testify at all under oath. There is no such requirement unless you interpret hindering an investigation to include not responding to questions which you may regard as self-incriminatory. Um, the federal legislation, I'll just touch upon briefly, uh, provides in the Canadian Human Rights Act that the Commission can make an ex parte application to a judge of the federal court to have a search warrant issued. And again, the requirements are, I think it's fair to say, akin to those set out in um, the Thompson and um, McKinley cases. Um, my information, though, is that, again, at the federal level, the, because of the, uh, of the uh, logistical con concerns and delays and time, um, the search warrant power is not the preferred method of obtaining information during investigations of the Federal Human Rights Commission. Once an investigation has been completed, as I indicated, if the Commission sends the case on to a Board of Inquiry, the Board of Inquiry then has the powers under the Statutory Powers Procedure Act uh, section 12 to issue a summons which uh, re requires a person to um, give evidence at a hearing or to produce in evidence documents and things specified by the tribunal. Um, in Alberta there was an early charter challenge to the um, uh, investigative powers of the commission uh, 
where under the Individuals' Rights Protection Act, which allowed for compulsory production of an individual's documents by the Human Rights Commission, the challenge was that that was an unreasonable search and seizure, and the Alberta court followed essentially the line which preceded the Supreme Court decisions and decided that that standard was not applicable um, in regulatory proceedings, which human rights proceedings clearly are, being remedial and compensatory rather than punitive and criminal. Um, in Ontario, most of the challenges have been with respect to summonses issued to witnesses under the SPPA and the jurisprudence of boards of inquiry um, has es essentially been that um, as much as it would be, um, it might be beneficial in particular cases which can become very complex. Human rights boards of inquiry can often take dozens of days um, for hearing. Um, the SPPA and the Human Rights Code does not provide for discovery. And so a summons issued for purposes of obtaining evidence to then evaluate and then choose what is to be introduced is not an appropriate summons under Section 12 of the SPPA. Uh, the SPPA is intended to permit a party to do two things, to testify orally and to produce an evidence hearing at the hearing documents which will, will be introduced in evidence. Um, I might just uh, mention in uh, closing a charter challenge that was launched in the uh, in a case called Dudnik against the York Condominium Corporation that may be familiar to you as the adult only condominium uh, adult only accommodation case. Um, the respondents asked the board the Condominium Corporation not to issue a subpoena pursuant to the SPPA on the basis that Section 12 uh, of the SPPA and the um, uh, supplementary section of the Human Rights Code violated Section 8 of the Charter. The board rejected the respondent's argument that forced production of documents before a board of inquiry is unreasonable seizure. Um, the uh, board found that Section 8 is not directed to a subpoena situation in a human rights board of inquiry, that an individual's right to privacy is not unreasonably constrained by a subpoena. Um, however, as in, in most of these administrative law cases involving Section 12, the board did then go on to consider the reasonableness of the subpoena in the context of the, um, of the proceeding and found that it was not unreasonable. Uh, in this case, you find, uh, and it's a, it's a 1990 decision, uh, you find uh, a, an echo of the number of the themes from the constitutional uh, decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada, um, which were issued at about the same time. I'll, perhaps I'll end on that note. Thank you very much. Linda? John Laskin's paper covers a broad range of issues relating to the enforcement powers of administrative agencies. My comments will be restricted to only two of those areas. First, cooperation with investigations by administrative agencies. And secondly, the power to compel testimony during such investigations and the implications of the Thompson decision in that regard. And I'll use the first as a lead into the second. In his paper, John attributes the fact that many parties cooperate with investigations conducted by regulatory agencies to the desire of those doing business with the agency, and in particular, professionals, to value the continuing relationship with that agency. I agree with that observation, but in my view, the desire to cooperate often relates to a number of other factors as well. The first factor is what I call the appearance of innocence or halo effect. <laughs> From my perspective as a regulator, it appears that many parties under investigation offer to cooperate to give the appearance that they have nothing to hide. The hope is that cooperation will be viewed by the regulator as evidence of moral, if not factual, innocence. Now, unfortunately, regulators don't always view it in the same light, and I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. The second, and in my view, the primary reason why parties may cooperate during a regulatory investigation is that they know that if they don't cooperate, they are faced with two unpleasant prospects. Either they will be subjected to searches and demands for documents, 
demands for compulsory testimony, or they will spend a lot of time and money and aggravation trying to challenge the agency's authority to take those steps. As a result, parties may cooperate to try to save some money and aggravation, and I think more importantly, to try to get some control over the investigatory process itself. Parties may be able to get some concessions or negotiate a less intrusive investigatory framework by cooperating with staff rather than resisting. For example, agency staff may be content to accept a chronology of events and a bundle of key documents relating to a particular transaction rather than compelling the contents of entire filing cabinet and requiring two days of compelled testimony if cooperation is offered. In my view, it is primarily that threat of compulsion which enables agencies to obtain such cooperation during the investigatory process. If the ability of administrative agencies to compel testimony and to obtain documentary evidence is significantly restricted by the application of the Charter of Rights, the agency's ability to investigate informally or on a voluntary basis also will be diminished as the agency's leverage to get that kind of cooperation will be gone or, or undermined. That la leads me into the next issue which I'd like to spend some time with and that is the impact of the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in the Thompson Newspapers case. I agree wholeheartedly with John Laskin's characterization of the Supreme Court's resolution of the issue of testimonial compulsion in that case as far from satisfactory and with his observation that just where Thompson leaves us with respect to the constitutionality of other statutory regimes is unclear. If the reasons of Justices Sapinka and Wilson are indicative of the direction that the Supreme Court will take the next time this issue is before it, the situation is even more troubling for administrative agencies like provincial securities commissions. I say that in part because it appears that the next time, or maybe not the next time, maybe the second or third time that the Supreme Court is going to consider this issue is when the appeal from the decision of the British Columbia Court of Appeal in a case called Branch and Levitt and the British Columbia Securities Commission is heard. Leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada from that decision of the British Columbia Court of Appeal was granted on September 24th of this year. Now, one of the issues in the appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada is whether Section 128 of the British Columbia Securities Act, which is very similar to subsection 11.4 of the Ontario Securities Act, and that's the power to compel testimony during an investigation, violates the right to remain silent or the privilege against self-incrimination pursuant to Section 7 of the Charter. Another issue is whether that provision and Section 5 of the Canada Evidence Act violate Section 7 because the combination of those two provisions allow evidence derived from a witness's compelled testimony to be used against the witness in other proceedings. Now, if we could turn at this point to the decision of the Supreme Court in Thompson itself, the judgments of Justices Sapinka and Wilson in that case are particularly unsettling for at least some administrative agencies because they appear to blur the distinction between the role of administrative agencies and the role of the police and disregard the practical difficulties involved in investigating complex business transactions and economic activities. Unlike a police investigation in relation to a murder or a fatal car accident, uh, there's no scene of the crime to scour for clues in a combines or securities investigation. As Justice Laforet observed, there is usually no smoking gun. Often the focus of the investigation will be to determine whether in fact there were any irregularities in the transaction at all, rather than a search for a particular suspect. In most cases, the only evidence which will really assist in making that determination will be oral statements or testimony and documents. And that is why the powers to compel testimony and the power to compel a production of documents are so critical to the ability of some administrative agencies to investigate effectively. Now, from a regulatory perspective, treating witnesses in these types of investigations like suspects and giving them all of the protections afforded to criminal accused at the investigatory stage as opposed to at a subsequent criminal trial uh, 
will inhibit effective detection and enf enforcement of regulatory malfeasance. Justice Wilson's conclusion that Section 7 of the Charter requires that a witness be protected at the investigatory stage against the subsequent use of evidence derived from testimony compelled is troubling for any administrative agency which has the ability to compel testimony during an investigation and also the power to initiate criminal or quasi-criminal charges. It will also pose problems for agencies which have the statutory authority to share compelled testimony with other agencies which have the ability to lay criminal or quasi-criminal charges. Now the practical impact of that judgment will be to require such agencies to seek legislative prohibitions on the use of compelled testimony and evidence derived from such testimony in any subsequent criminal or quasi-criminal prosecution in order to save the power to compel such testimony at the first instance. Now, this could be problematic for provincial regulatory agencies, which can't dictate the rules of evidence to be applied in prosecutions pursuant to the criminal code. To avoid that problem, such agencies may have to seek to prohibit absolutely the transmission of such testimony to police agencies and also to other agencies which have the power to initiate such charges. Such limitations on the ability of administrative agencies to cooperate with each other and with police agencies is a very real concern for agencies which depend upon cooperation with other provincial, extra-provincial, and international agencies. And again, I point to provincial securities commissions as a very good example. Now, the decision of Justice Sapinka would have an even greater impact on the ability of regulatory agencies to investigate effectively. His decision suggests that any legislative scheme which does not restrict the power to compel testimony to investigations of non-criminal or non-quasi-criminal activity is contrary to Section 7. This would seem to require that administrative agencies limit their ability to compel testimony to investigations leading to regulatory proceedings only. Now this may mean that agencies would have to decide whether to pursue a criminal or quasi-criminal prosecution as opposed to a regulatory proceeding prior to investigating the conduct in question. Agencies would have to decide how to investigate before knowing the seriousness of the conduct being investigated. As I indicated earlier, such a restriction on the power to compel testimony may undermine the ability of administrative agencies to obtain evidence on an informal or voluntary basis. Another possible outcome of the decision of Justice Sapinka may be to require administrative agencies to identify targets or possible suspects at the outset of an investigation. Justice Sapinka's judgment leaves open the possibility that compelling testimony from a person who is merely a witness and not a suspect or possible target may be an example of the type of the use of the power to compel which would not violate the right to remain silent. But unfortunately, making that distinction between a target and a non-target at an early stage of a regulatory investigation often will be impossible and again ignores the fundamental distinction between the investigations of crimes and the investigation of complex economic activity. As I indicated earlier, the focus of regulatory investigations often is not to find who did it, but rather, did it happen at all? Now, unlike Justices Wilson and Sapinka, Justices Leroux Dubé and Laforet were careful to distinguish between criminal and regulatory investigations and indicated an appreciation for the difficulties inherent in investigating complex economic activity. Both rejected the argument that Section 7 prohibits the power to compel testimony at the investigatory stage. Although Justice LaForay concluded that in certain situations, the admission of evidence derived from such testimony in criminal proceedings could offend Section 7, he was content to leave the question of the admissibility of that evidence to the trial judge hearing the criminal prosecution. So the decisions of those two justices would preserve the status quo for many administrative agencies which have the power to compel testimony at the investigatory stage. 
Until clarification is coming from the Supreme Court of Canada, where does the Thompson decision leave administrative agencies which have the power to compel testimony? In the interim, in my view, such agencies would be well advised to resort to the power to compel testimony with caution. Only when it is absolutely necessary to compel testimony should the power be exercised, and when that power is used, it should be used only to the extent necessary. If targets can be identified, they should be examined last, or perhaps not at all. And finally, if any police agencies are foolhardy enough to request transcripts of such compelled testimony, the agency would be well advised to refuse the request unless the witness specifically consents to the release of the transcript to the police. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Howard? Thank you very much, Phil. Um, I know that John wrote a very good paper because it took him so long to write it. <laughs> and uh, I, um, I think it is an excellent paper and I'm privileged to be here to, to uh, give you some comments. Um, I think what I'm going to do is try and rise a little bit above the quality of the legal analysis that uh, my colleagues have given you and give you a bit of a sense of um, some of these decisions from the perspective of the uh, Bureau of Competition Policy. Uh, I'm batting cleanup here, and the one thing that I can say about the Thompson decision is, besides it emanating from the Competition Bureau, is that we won. <laughs> now, uh, I, I, I know that may be hard to believe, and, and I can understand any anxiety about that comment, but. I have asked a number of uh, legal colleagues and they insist that the government won that case. And so I take the position that all the powers in the Competition Act, whether they be search and seizure, document production, oral discovery, and there's a fourth which I just can't remember but I know is in my notes, are all constitutionally valid. Um, perhaps in this Levitt case we'll find out whether that's true or not. Now, in, in a typical sort of administrative law forum, what I'd like to do is, is um, say that I think we've got some problems of characterization going on here. And I don't want to be regressive, but frankly, I'm a little troubled by the way in which the courts have characterized these competition law offenses. Because we have criminal offenses in the law, we have civil trade practices, which some call administrative trade practices, which some call just trade practices. Um, frankly, I don't know what you call them. The, the Act doesn't call them civil trade practices, that's for sure. We have competition advocacy provisions. The courts have recently been calling Competition Act offenses public welfare offenses, and others have been calling them regulatory offenses. Now. I have a bit of difficulty, for example, with the criminal law offenses, and particularly in the context of Thompson, because my philosophy is a rose by any other name. The criminal law is the criminal law. And when you look at the Competition Act and price fixing, it's an indictable offense. There's a $10 million fine and, 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 and incarceration for up to five years. Now, I think that's a fairly tough regulatory public welfare offense. <laughs> now, frankly, I don't know what kind of administrative agency does this kind of work. Um, I always call the Competition Bureau a law enforcement agency. Now, Linda mentioned that in her comments to some extent, and I know that Justice Laforet, who I have an enormous amount of respect for, talked about that somewhat in the Thompson decision. But you need to do me a favor and tell me what we do. Because frankly, I say we are a law enforcement agency. And the reason why is because we have enforcement powers that allow for search and seizure and the other things that I've just mentioned. But we also have civil provisions. And those powers apply to that as well, fully and without exception, although we use them differently and less so. So what has happened here with respect to criminal enforcement and the criminal law? Well, like in economics, we've got spillover effects. 
And frankly, I don't like spillover effects because spillover effects in economic terms create all kinds of economic distortions like first free rider problems, etc. So what we have going on here in competition law terms is the criminal law free riding on the Competition Act, this public welfare law, this regulatory law. And it creates no end of problems for the Competition Bureau in attempting to investigate the kinds of things that Linda talked about, which I will not go over. What has Hunter and Southern done? Well, that's another competition case. Um, it's increased the standards for search and seizure. What's, what, inf what impact has that had? Well, we do more investigatory work. Cases are harder to prove, mostly because we need to do more work to get the evidence. Therefore, we have fewer searches, and we have fewer cases that can be investigated, and we have fewer preliminary cases that are initiated because the standards are higher. Now, from a government perspective and from a private sector perspective, that may be okay, but the result is that. So it's had a direct impact on the law enforcement activity. Similar impacts will obviously occur in cases like Thompson if Thompson is wrong in the way that we've characterized it. Now, so that first issue is one of characterization. I recognize I've answered no question. I'm just raising some issues. In that regard, by the way, I might say that John has indicated that the courts have shown deference to the enforcement powers of administrative agencies if the Competition Bureau is an administrative agency, and I would agree with that point. Uh, the second point I'd like to characterize is this thing called lumping. I call it lumping because I'm not sure whether it's appropriate to lump all these regulatory statutes together and apply some common standards to investigative powers in all circumstances. The standards for the exercise of investigative powers under the Competition Act are fairly high and I believe are fully respectful of the rights of those under investigation. And I think, I think they compare favorably against those found in other regulatory statutes. The third thing which John raises, a, a point that I'd like to mention, is this notion of out of bounds. I call it the out of bounds syndrome or the out of bounds thought because he talks about the authority to commence an investigation often not limited to the minimum level of belief that many agents conduct these informal investigations with no statutory mandate. Now, I'm not sure what that means, but we do this a lot. <laughs> so we might be out of bounds, but John, I don't think we're out of bounds. And so from the perspective of these informal investigations, these are just examinations. These are simply examinations to get facts to determine whether or not we need to have a formal investigation. Now, um, obviously, if you, if you look at Thompson, as Linda's just described and you have, Mr. Justice Laforé realizes that these offenses typically take the form of subtle alterations in otherwise perfectly legal business practices. So I'm not so sure whether or not these informal investigations are not just part of the overall investigatory process. Now, my fourth point is um, a point of what you say is what you do. And this is the point in relation to taking a seriously the obligation to take a hard look at each case before simply applying its policy guidelines. I would agree with that. But what I'd like to say is in the Competition Bureau, as many of you know, or as a number of you know, we do rely on guidelines. We have issued guidelines with respect to mergers, we call them merger enforcement guidelines, predatory pricing, which we call predatory pricing enforcement guidelines. I want to underline the word enforcement. Price discrimination enforcement guidelines have also been issued, as well as misleading advertising enforcement guidelines. There is a reason for calling them enforcement guidelines, because they are indeed enforcement policy guidelines. What we have to be careful of, though, is that we don't have hidden guidelines. Because with enforcement guidelines, you have to be bound, I believe, by the guidelines that you have issued. And there is some danger in hidden guidelines when you issue these guidelines. My last um, uh, two points is 
the compliance policy approach. I think all agencies or many agencies use compliance policy or compliance um, uh, uh, tools in the enforcement of their laws. Um, what I worry about in compliance is what I'd like to call, as I just wrote here for Phil, the truth versus advocacy problem. Uh, lawyers are very good at advocating the truth. And it does create some concerns when you have a compliance approach because there is a notion that when you engage in a compliance approach that you should not engage in or use your formal investigatory tools. Let me assure you that I do not agree with that whatsoever because the flip side of the compliance approach is indeed the risk of the enforcement of your formal powers under your laws. My last point is immunity. I will make only one comment with respect to immunity, and that is this. In, we, you may have read this week that we resolved a case in the federal court involving immunity with respect to a corporation. It is the first time that the Competition Bureau and the Attorney General has given immunity to a corporation with respect to the commission of an indictable offense under the Competition Act. The point I would like to make is immunity should not be used as an enforcement tool. It is not an enforcement tool. But if it is not an enforcement tool, then what is it? Those are all my comments. <laughs> Thank you, Howard. Our practice has been to give the uh, speaker an opportunity to respond to the commentators. And uh, I'd give John one, except that he told me he uh, thinks he'd uh, rather give you time for questions given the way we're running on. Uh, are there any questions of any of the, uh, of John or any of the commentators? Howard will be back to answer any questions you may have as soon as he gets some water. No questions. Well, if there are no questions, I have a question. Uh -huh. Might as well have one. We're not at uh, 4.45 yet. And my question is for Linda. It, it, it comes to this. When, when, and it, it relates somewhat to what, what Howard said about voluntary compliance. Uh, I have a bit of difficulty with the concept of voluntary compliance. If I have a client uh, who tells me that the Securities Commission, to take an abstract example, has um, <laughs> called them and wants them to come in and talk to them voluntarily, and I say, what about, and he says, well, it's not clear, they told me about these transactions, or whatever. My normal approach to the Securities Commission is to say, I'm quite happy to have my client talk to you, but I'd like you to give me equivalent protection to what I'd have if you had a formal investigation, or get a formal investigation order. And frequently in the past, that's been the practice with the Commission, and I do it, and, and they, they've done that when they've had to. They've got a Section 11 order, and my client has come in, in my view, voluntarily, uh, but, but under the protections that would be provided by a formal investigation. And I do that in, in part for a number of the reasons that Linda mentioned. I guess my question in light of her analysis of Thompson is uh, whether the Commission will do that <laughs> in the future. And, 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 it, it just, and I ask that because it seems to me that it's only sensible for someone you want to talk to voluntarily who isn't sure whether they're the subject of, of an investigation, the target of an investigation, or may become one after you have found out what really happened, uh, it makes sense for them to ask for that kind of protection up front. How are you going to deal with that in light of Thompson? Well, I can't bind the commission by my comments here, of well, obviously. <laughs> but um, certainly, I don't see anything wrong any time anyone is uh, representing someone who's requested to come in and testify under, under, either under oath under compulsion or to come in and speak voluntarily from calling up staff and talking a little bit about why it is we want your client in. Now in some cases we won't be prepared to answer that question as you well know, but in many cases it may well be that we will be prepared to be a little bit more flexible in terms of how we get the information from your client. And I think that's nothing new. Uh, the enforcement branch of the Commission attempts as best we can to be firm yet fair and consistent. So <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Uh it seems to have provoked another one from Jim Bailey, though. <laughs>
uh, just so they get it on the tape, the request relates to, the, the question relates to a request for a waiver by a, a, a person of his solicitor client privilege. Who'd like to respond to that? John? I noticed you volunteered. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, I don't know whether it's a legitimate request or not from a regulator, but I think if I were on the other side, I'd be asking for something in return. Uh, number one. And number two, I think I'd be very concerned about if I waived it for the purpose of uh, discussions with a regulator, whether I waived it for other purposes as well, which uh, obviously would concern me, whether it was in civil proceedings or other administrative proceedings or whatever. I mean, uh, to me, that's a major concern. Linda or Howard want to add anything? I'm not quite sure how the example might work. Uh, Jim, I might be missing this a bit. As you know, in the Competition Act, we have a whole code of procedure to deal with solicitor-client privilege where, for example, we search and a solicitor client privilege is raised on documents or protected information, and we have a whole code to deal with that, which is very complex and not very workable most of the time, but, and we haven't used it that much, fortunately. But I'm not quite sure the example that you are giving, let me give you an example. Is, is, is it the situation, for example, that the Competition Bureau might be investigating a price fixing case? And we are, if that's an example of it, I'm not sure, maybe this only applies to a Securities Commission matter. But if we were investigating a price fixing case, and would there be a solicitor or counsel who might have evidence of the price fixing? Or would it be, I'm not sure of the context, frankly, so I can't help in the, in the response. Yes. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. I have no personal experience with that in the Competition Bureau, but maybe the Department of Justice does. I'm sorry. Well, we don't have anyone from the Department of Justice here to respond to that. Um, <laughs> if. Uh, we're now over our time, so I'll uh, call a halt to today's proceeding and thank John and the commentators for their remarks. We reconvene tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. <laughs>